the, um, the app crashed, so I'm having to restart it. Yeah. It does that sometimes. Well, that thing's a piece of junk. Control. Sorry. No, it's all right. <coughs> Hi, good morning. Great to see everyone here. <clears throat> Allergies are after me this morning, so uh, if I stop to cough, just keep singing. Just keep on singing. Let's stand and sing Light the Fire. <clears throat> Jimmy Hyatt's bringing our communion thoughts this morning. <clears throat> Come, let us
over and care for us each and every day like you do. We hope that you will help us to go out in this world and uh, be better and stronger Christians. We want to thank you for our church here that we have and be able to worship you. We want to thank you for uh, that opportunity. We hope that you will be with those who are sick and are, are, are just not having a good time. We hope that you will watch over them. We hope that you will bless those that are troubled in any way possible. We, we pray that you will be with those who have lost loved ones 
and we want to always remember those lives that were lost uh, 20 years ago yesterday. We pray for those families still. We want to hope that we will be encouraged by the things that we hear today. We pray for our elders and our deacons, and we pray for the ministers that we give and all the different things that we do to help spread your word. We pray for the upcoming events that we have planned, that we will all be strong together and unite as, a, as Christians and be powerful in spreading your word. And we just thank you again for your love of sending Jesus to die for our sins and forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today's scripture is found in 2 Corinthians 5, 15 to 17. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer let me start with, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on we regard no one from a worthy point of view, though we want for you once regarded Christ in this way, we do so longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. <clears throat> Those uh, kids can be dismissed to the Children's Church at this time. Bear with me, the, the app is being cranky with me this morning. Let's sing Wonderful Words of Life. Let's all stand.
minutes to let you know about something we have coming two weeks from today is our Family Fun Sunday. This is one of our big events with the intention of having the unchurched of our community and surrounding communities to feel welcomed into our presence so that we can reach out to them and be able to present them with the gospel. But one of the things that we have been learning in the last two or three years is it, it helps to incentivize uh, some way, something that attracts them to come to this place. And although I know that you and I know that the reason we come to worship is it's not about ourselves, it's about God, amen? And we're not here pushing entertainment to entertain people, but we do feel that there are some methods that maybe might let you think or make you feel uncomfortable with uh, some of the things that we try to do, but we have found success in the past of trying to reach uh, uh, an audience, our, mark, our market audience, our target audience, I should say, in Blackwell and the surrounding communities to, to reach out with something that does pique their interest to get them here and to hear the good news. I'm reminded of Jesus in Matthew 22 when he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who threw a wedding banquet. Whenever Jesus said anything about the kingdom of heaven, he was explaining, here's what it's like in the church. And when you think of a wedding banquet, I hope you think of a festive, joyful, uh, wonderful celebration where people are coming to, to be filled with joy and to maybe have a good time, however you want to uh, interpret that is, is up to you, but to, to come and, and, and have this celebration. And there's so many other stories that Jesus talked about that included this celebration concept. The prodigal son, for example, when the father sees the prodigal coming back, he has, of course, the robe put on him and the ring on his finger and kill the fatted calf. And there's this joyful celebration scene you and I can read about and it's describing the kingdom. And of course in that, the father is God. And of course we're the prodigal of that story or perhaps the older brother of that story. I'm not here to talk about those parables necessarily. I am here to use that though to tell you that on our Family Fun Sunday, we're gonna be doing some things that I think will interest our community. We're going to have at 9 o'clock uh, coffee and donuts and we're going to have them come into the building and we're going to have time to greet them and, and uh, get them to where they know where they need to be uh, to get certain things that uh, are going to be of interest to them. We're giving away a lot of things that have been donated to us to help promote this. I'll talk more about that next Sunday. The thing I want to at least make mention of right now, and this is vitally important. Everybody say, this is important. This is important. And I want you to know that this is important because in our training, the last two or three years with the 24 to double module training we've been going through, uh, this is the key, this is the key for this church to grow in number, and that is to get every one of our members to invite, to invite to invite, okay? Again, in the Matthew 22 wedding banquet, that was part of that narrative, was the wedding banquet was an invitation event. So here are two things I wanna show you. Before you leave today, I'm asking, I told you the class this morning, I'm telling, but I am asking, but I'm, I'm asking fervently Please don't leave here today without picking up several of these postcards that are advertising the event in two weeks. And take them to people that need to be here. Let me ask you this. Do you know somebody that needs to be here who is not? Do you know someone, do you know a family do you have a coworker that perhaps you know for a fact they don't go to church anywhere and you would love to see them come here and worship with you? 
Take this card to them. Invite them. Take this flyer and you can show people or if you have places you think you could hang this up this shows all the things that will be an incentive for them to want to be here now they may come for the wrong reason but we're going to give them the right message i want to tell you honestly i promise you they're going to get the gospel but there is a chance for them to win a few things too now it's not just about winning, it's about having family fun. And, and so what we're going to do is we're going to have a portion during the Bible class hour where we're presenting some things to the adults and we're presenting some things to the kids and to keep them uh, their attention span and to connect with them. And then worship will be unchanged. It'll be like we've done this morning with a message about being alive, which is part of our vision statement, alive, connected, full of hope. And we're going to talk about that first part, that alive part of our vision, that, that we ought to be lively and we ought to give people the opportunity to hear about Jesus who can make them alive. I mean, really alive. How many of you know there are some people just making a living and then there are some people who have a life? And there's a difference. We'll give that message. Uh, toward the end of the worship assembly, we're going to have one of the drawings, the early bird drawing. They've come to sign up for at 9 o'clock. We'll have that drawing, and then after that, we're going to go outside. We've got middle school playground permission from the principal to use to have carnival games. We're going to start off with a hot dog feed, ice cream social. This was Terrell's idea. He's all about an ice cream social. So we're going to have an ice cream social to follow. We're going to have carnival games. How many of you play cornhole? Okay, how many of you have pitched horseshoes? We're going to have that set up through the afternoon till 2 o'clock. We're going to do all those things. And kids, we're going to do, and I know they've already gone up, but some of you are still kids and you love carnival games, and we're going to do that. We kind of thought of this idea thinking that the fair coming to town was going to be kind of lean. I guess they've gotten a little bit more rides than they earlier thought, but we're going to have just a lot of fun, and it's free. That's the operative word. Would you do me a favor before you leave? Pick up at least seven of these to give to unchurched people. That was a question. Will you do this? And not just for me, but will you do this for the body of Christ? And pick up at least one of these or more if you think you have a place and you can, you can show people, look at what we're doing here that day. It's going to be fun. It's going to be exciting. The focus of worship is on God, but we're going to do all these things. It's a method that we want to try. The last time that we had a successful big event like this, we, it generated a lot of Bible studies. We're going to offer those Bible studies, and we had several that were baptized in that one year. And we're just coming out of this uh, kind of dormancy mode uh, during COVID to try to get these going again. So. Pick these up, pick some of these up, and this week, it's pertinent that that happens this week. This is sort of a save the date postcard. Okay, now on to the sermon. Are you ready for the sermon? Yes, okay. Open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We continue our One Thing series. And we've been in Galatians quite a bit, but I want to start off today in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and while you're turning there let me make mention of the sermon title changing our perspective and what I mean is the way we look at things and that could be in regards to how we view ourselves how we view others and of course, obviously, how do we view God in our lives? Change in perspective is sometimes necessary to move forward with progress. You may look at something like what we're just now pitching for two weeks from today, this big event, thinking we've never seen anything like this before. And it might make us feel uncomfortable at times. But again, I assure you, we're not changing the message. We're changing some methods, but not the message. And it's in an effort to do what the Apostle Paul says, this is what I'm really sold out to do, to become all things to all men, so that by all means, methods, 
I might save some. That was his intent for his ministry. We saw that. We talked about that last week when we were speaking on the message, Fuel for the Fire. Remember Jeremiah who said, I tried to keep quiet, but it was like a, his word was in my bones, like a, a fire burning up, and I couldn't hold back. It was that intense. And Paul had that intensity and in wanting to get the gospel to everybody. We have to sometimes change our perspective to be open to what will work today. And we know things that don't work. People aren't just showing up for church for the reasons they would show up for church 20, 30, 40 years ago. You know that's a fact, don't you? That is a fact. By and large, people are not going to be drawn just because you go to church and think, I come meet a lot of nice folks with us and, and sing and hear our preacher or this or that. And, and even, to, even if you throw in the meal, the fellowship meal, we know that that works on some level. But people are just not as attracted to that anymore today. We need a change of perspective to be right with God to begin with. And, and I can tell you this. One of the stories that really is embedded in my mind is one of my favorite miracle stories, and I use this in lesson one whenever I'm, whenever I'm studying with somebody, hoping to convert them to, so that they'll obey the gospel. It comes from the gospel of Mark, and it's the man whose dwelling was among the tombs, and he had a legion of demons. How many of you know the story I'm talking about? You see, Jesus had stepped off this boat, and here comes a man running up to, to Jesus, and he or the demons are saying, Jesus, what do you want to do with us, Jesus? What are you going to do to us? You see, the demons believe and tremble. We know that from the Word of God, right? And this guy, if you think about his life, how destitute he was, how much emotional and physical pain that he was in, not having any control or the ability to make his own decisions, because there's a legion of demons that's invaded his body that are possessing his body, and he's not in control. On one occasion in that narrative, Jesus says, what is your name? And I think the man is trying to talk for himself. He says, my name is... But then you see these words, legion, for we are many. That was pretty good, wasn't it? I'm Batman. Yeah, that works. Legion, for we are many. And I don't know if you notice or not, grammar people out there, you go from a first person singular pronoun to a plural pronoun. My name is Legion for we are many. It's like the guy can't even talk for himself. We, we know this about this man. He has often cut himself with stones, probably to distract from other pain in parts of his body. We know he's been bound hand and foot, but he, the chains won't keep him. He'll break them. Well, you might be wondering, well, why would you chain him? You know, let him run away. Well, he's not going to run away, but you don't want him when you're, you're burying Aunt Gertrude at the cemetery. You don't want him hooping and hollering. Probably kind of detained him just for a while till we got the graveside service done and we're out of here. That's where he lived. But we see something toward the end of the story, and I'm not talking about when the when the legion of demons is driven out into the pigs and of course they run off the cliff and they drown and of course you know my jokes about that first case of swine flu or our first helping of deviled ham anyway I'm talking about the part in the text that says after the villagers had come to uh, see Jesus they see this man and it says in the text sitting there clothed and in his mind that's the part I want you to focus on sitting there clothed and in his right mind I suggest to you he's probably not had any peace for a very long time. Why would the text say that he was clothed unless beforehand he wasn't? And he's in his right mind now able to speak for himself. I ask you the question this morning, did this man have a change in perspective? 
and it wasn't it radical how different it is from him to go for however long he had to endure that and now looks down at his scars and his body and knows I no longer have to stay in this condition I'm new let's look at the text 2nd Corinthians 5 we're going to start with verse 14 we used this last week in our fuel for the fire about what's driving you what's motivating you for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died that's the gospel in a nutshell it is more expanded he died he was buried and he was raised from the dead but here it is presented by Paul as he's writing to the church at Corinth that one died for all and therefore all died and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves they live differently right but for him who died for them and was raised again and there's a lot implied in that he died and we can go through that death with him and he was raised from the dead and we go through a resurrection with him that's Romans 6 3 and 4 that when we're baptized it's in the likeness of his death his burial his resurrection we're raised to walk in newness of life if we've been planted together with his death in that likeness so shall we be in his resurrection and like Jesus said to Mary and Martha Lazarus sisters though this man be dead yet shall he live why because I am the what resurrection and the life John 11 verse 25 when we come back to this text now look at verse 16 so from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view though we once regarded Christ in this way we do so no longer therefore if anyone I love this verse you know this verse therefore if anyone this is 17 if anyone who anyone is in Christ the new creation has come the old has gone the new is here you ever thought to yourself you been through something did an activity or two or saw something for the first time in your life and you you, you make this comment to yourself, this changes everything. That's true. And definitely the writer of this book knew that was true, didn't he? I mean, you talk about the radical change of the man with the legion of demons. Let's talk about Saul for just a brief moment, who's persecuting Christians, breathing out threats. He's got letters in his hand giving him the right to do so. And he's on that road to Damascus, and he's met with the bright light, and he speaks to Jesus who says why are you persecuting me and go into this town find Ananias he's going to tell you what you need to do in prepping Ananias God is saying I'm sending him to you he's thinking are you sure haven't you heard about this guy what he's doing to us Christians and God's message to Ananias was I've chosen him to be an instrument for me and what a instrument he became used of God the missionary journeys, the, the being stoned and left for dead, the planning of churches, the writing of so many of these letters that we have in our New Testament today. What a radical change. The old was gone and everything became new. And remember as we introduced this series, I used that text from Philippians for this one thing where Paul said, one thing I do. And what did he say? Forgetting what is where? Behind. And pressing forward to basically what is ahead. The goal. The mark of God. The high calling. 
a different agenda. Change in perspective with the demoniac. Change in perspective with Paul. Change in perspective with us individually, but as a church as well, is needed to bring more people to Christ today. And what is needed for them is to have this opportunity to change their perspective. I mentioned our vision statement, alive, connected, and that third part, full of hope. Do you know anybody in your life that needs hope right now? There's parents of a 16-year-old in Oklahoma City watching their son on a respirator fighting for his life, featured on Channel 4, Levi Barnett. We're praying for him as a community, a football player here. How many of you saw that post? And I put that out on our Facebook to say, be praying for this man. Don't they need some hope? Yeah. How about the guy who just came home this week to break the news to his wife and his family that he's been diagnosed with some terminal illness? Don't you think that they need hope? And they need something to latch onto that'll be more meaningful than what media's going to give or what uh, you know, friends might even offer. We know what the world needs is Jesus and they need this change of perspective. We were talking about in our class, we're doing the master's class. Uh, these are how-to instructional things you'll see on social media a lot. Uh, a master class on this, a master class on that. We're looking at the master teaching on what he did about how to do things today. We were talking about prayer, weren't we? And in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, and in every part of that sermon, one thing Jesus is pointing out is that the Pharisees, the hypocrites that he calls them, the religious right, teachers of the law, their perspective was on themselves. And those things that he says, he says, don't be like them. And he talked about those who stood on the corners to pray long-winded prayers with vain repetition, with babbling, and, and just to be what? Seen by others. When you fast, which means he implies we do, Right? Or will when we fast don't be like those who disfigure their faces and try to appear famished to make it look like they're more holy and religious because look at them they must be fasting bravo to be seen by who others when you give don't don't do it sounding the trumpet making sure everybody gets an eye on what you're giving and here you go look at that top that no, Jesus says, do these things in secret. Same with prayer. Don't be like the one doing it to be seen. But go to your closet where the Father sees in secret. He'll reward you in secret. These people are getting their reward. And there's so many other things that we could go into. But the, the main point is there must be a change of focus. I find it kind of odd when you first read the Sermon on the Mount where you have all this stuff where Jesus say saying, uh, don't do this to be seen by men. Don't do this to be seen by others. Don't do that to be seen by others. But he says, we're light and we're soft. And guess what he says? Let your light shine. Why? So others may see your good works, but give glory to God. You think, well, is he contradicting himself? No, he's not contradicting himself. What he's saying is there's a change of perspective in how you approach it. The one is approaching it to have the spotlight and the other is to give the spotlight to God the Creator that's the change of perspective this world needs to be full of hope and it's what I think he's trying to get across to these churches as he's writing to Corinth and to the churches in Galatia as we've been looking at things in Galatians. And he says here in verse 16, from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. And, and again, it, it speaks so much to the Sermon on the Mount content. Don't do as the rest of the people in this world are doing. Walk that second mile, turn the other cheek. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, he says. Or the rhetorical question that he gives. If you do good to those who do good to you, then what more are you doing than others are doing? 
The rest of the world does that. I'll rub your back if you rub mine. The rest of the world's doing that. We are to transcend our attitude and our behavior and our action and what we display is for glory of God. We're to transcend what the world's willing to do because there's good folks that'll do that. But we're supposed to be different and it takes a change of perspective to go from the worldly point of view. And he says here in the second part of verse 16, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. Everything, everything is new. The new is here. Now open your Bibles to Romans. We're looking at chapter 7 for a moment. Romans 7. Because I want you to see how that change of perspective ought to be applied to you as an individual. How it's applied to you. In Romans 7, Paul gives his own personal example, and we already mentioned, how much more radical of a change can you think of? I mean, kind of like the legion of demons guy, and then you got the Apostle Paul coming from Saul, persecuted Christians, the Paul making Christians, okay? But there's a, there's a thing about Paul as he viewed himself, I want us to see, and we see it right here in Romans 7. And he begins to describe this nature of the law and how he was attached to the law in chapter 7. And he's so attached, he is so determined to make sure he does everything that he can possibly do that would be right. And that's not bad. As a matter of fact, we ought to seek to do right. Right? We ought to. That should be our intention. But he says this in verse 14. You're going to love this. Romans 7, 14. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. Now, he's already mentioned in 3.23, we're all sinners, right? He goes on to say here, verse 15, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature. I prefer the word flesh there. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. How many of you have made a mistake, but you didn't intend to? You wanted to do the right thing, but you ended up not doing the right thing. Anybody with me on that? Or am I by myself hung out to dry, right? I have the desire to do good, but sometimes I fall down, and so do you. Verse 19, for I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it's sin living in me that does it. Are you with me so far? So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from the body that is subject to death? He says there's a war going on. It's a war in my mind because I'm trying to do things with my flesh that don't seem to always turn out very good. And he's saying it's a struggle is real. Now he's speaking, of course, how he was trying to live his life under Judaism. And, and when you see him say these things, like, it is no longer I that's doing it, does that not sound a little reminiscent to maybe the guy who had the legion of demons who was saying, you know, that's true of me. It wasn't me that was doing it. It wasn't me that was saying it. I was being controlled. I was being taken over. You know, some people who had an impure spirit in the Bible, it says they would foam at the mouth or it even tried to throw the guy into a fire on one occasion with another demoniac this guy can relate probably to what Paul's saying I wanted to do good but he was being manipulated Paul saying I want to do good but it was by my choice and bad choices I made 
because I was fleshly driven then and that's why he says it was I that no longer does it. Now let me remind us of something that we looked at last week from Galatians 2 verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I what? Live. But not I. But Christ lives in me. I almost have to sing the song to quote the verse. You ever have that problem? And if I don't sing it, then I, I can't remember the rest of it. But he talks about the life I live. He talks about how, yeah, let's sing it together. Chad, can you lead us in a verse of uh, for I've been crucified with Christ or help me out? Or is it I am crucified with Christ? Whichever way you want to go, brother. Just stand up right there. Let's sing this uh, line, would you? I'm going to see how our new song leader likes being put on the spot. Crucified with Christ had this going on here that was troubling him, eating him alive, a war waging in him. But I want you to move on with me to see what happens next. When he asks the question, who's going to rescue me? He's looking for hope here, isn't he? And in verse 25, he says, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. But this goes on. Chapter 8, 1 is a conjunction. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. Let me stop. Before that, in that section, that tongue-twisting section I read, do you see condemnation there? Self-condemnation, isn't it? A cloud of guilt and shame for where he was at in life for wanting to do what's right but couldn't do it all the time we've already talked about do it yourself Christianity you can't save yourself by your own works we must depend on the grace of God and look at chapter 8 verse 1 again therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus and I want to say there's a correlation to that to the 2 Corinthians 5 17 passage if you are in Christ, everything's become what? New. And the old is gone. And he says, verse 2, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. You've been set free. You were powerless in this other way, but I had a change of perspective. Now that should be related to you as an individual but it also should affect how you view others like he said in our text we no longer regard people from a worldly point of view where sometimes judgment can be quick and harsh and we're insensitive why don't we show more grace these days hey if his grace reached you shouldn't you channel it to others does not the Bible teach us that you ought to forgive because you've been what? Forgiven. Does not the Bible teach love others because he first loved us? We perpetuate what we receive and move it into the lives of other people. But it's got to start with you first because a lot of us are waking up in the morning thinking about what I got to do, what I need to do, what I, where I need to be and what I need to say and, and uh, what's uh, expected of me and, and what I want. And we're kind of wrapped up in me and the perspective needs to change where we're living for God and not me. And how I view others. And I grew up, although I did not attend, well, I did attend one of the churches that had a bus ministry uh, Kim Be Beezing, you're here with us this morning. You'll remember Garriott Road Church had one of the largest bus ministries I can ever imagine. I think I would drive down Garriott Road in Enid, Oklahoma. At one time, I saw maybe 20 buses out there. They were called Joy Buses. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Joy Buses. Remember those? And on, on the buses we had where we lived in Louisiana, it had the word joy on the back. And, 
it said for J, Jesus first. Y'all remember this? O was other second. What was the Y for? Yourself last. We need that change of perspective today for when we regard ourselves and we put others before us to get them. You may think, I'm not sure I like what y'all are going to do here this Sunday and uh, I may just choose to stay home. That's exactly not what I want you to do. You need to be here to look at the people that are coming through the door to be loving to them and saying, I'm not here for me. This is not about me. What we're doing right now at this very moment as we've entered into this place, not, just, not because it's the place, but because of what we're doing here today in our worship together as we've communed and prayed and seen, hearing God's word preached, it's not about you. Let me hear, I want, I want to say it again, I want you to hear it. This is not about you. This is about God. And it's about bringing others to God. But it has to start with you having a change of perspective to bring honor to God. I'll close with one passage here. The one thing, the one thing part of this sermon is from Galatians 5, verse 6. We've used this before, but I want to come back to this. And I want you to see the one thing point that I'm making this morning. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing, you see that word, that phrase? The only thing, what's the only thing mean? That there's this one thing here. The one thing, as we seek to bring a revolution of love to our world, requiring this change in our perspective, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through what? Love. Let me read it again. For in Christ Jesus, Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. And I'm gonna I wanna dive into this. I've kind of thought about doing this or not doing it, and I may get in trouble, Gail, but uh, we have an elders meeting a little bit later this afternoon. We can discuss it, I guess. But I, I want to make sure we're hearing circumcision was very important for some people in this church, in these churches of Galatia, because they had gone it, they had gone through it, and if new people are coming in here, they gotta jump through the hoops I've come through. That's all about what we're seeing in Galatians. Circumcision was so vitally important. And others were saying, I don't see where God requires me to do what the law stated you had to do since I'm not under law anymore. It, it doesn't have value. Does it mean something to you? Yes. To the, vac uh, to, to the vaccinated. This is where I'm going with this. Let me just go ahead and put that out there. Neither vaccination nor non-vaccination has any value. I'm tired of the rhetoric. Aren't you? I'm tired of the extreme on both sides. I know where I stand but I ain't got to put it out there on social media just to see if I can get some people on my bandwagon. And you've seen it too, polarizing sides. You see, our, our problem is not on the subject of circumcision or uncircumcision. It's on whether you wear a mask or not, or it's on whether you get vaccinated or not, or it may be something else that's not even a part of the pandemic scene. It may be something else going on, but no matter what you're talking about, nothing matters as much as that which cost us our spiritual journey, and that's the only thing that has value. Am I fired?
Can anybody say amen to that? That Jesus is the only thing that has value. And that's my one thing point. This morning, if there's something that's on your heart that's keeping you from being where Jesus wants you to be, maybe you need change of perspective. We're here to help you look at Jesus. We want to show you Jesus, not ourselves. But let's show you Jesus this morning. Won't you come as we stand and sing? Yvonne Mittal has come to say, I've got to have this change of perspective, and it's something she's struggling with. She actually used the word, I'm being held as a prisoner. And you can be free from the body of sin and death because of Jesus. Now, you're a Christian, you're a child of God. We just need to help each other sometimes to refocus and put our vision back on the Lord. Amen? We're going to pray for Yvonne, and I suspect there's others too that perhaps where you're sitting, you're thinking, you know, there's an area in my life I'm being captive, held captive by. Whatever that is that you've got to surrender, I want you to think about this prayer that we're fixing to offer on behalf of Yvonne, but pray it for yourself too if that's a need that you have. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, let me see who I've got here. David, thank you. One of our elders, David Kersey, will come up here and lead us in a prayer uh, for Yvonne. And let's give her encouragement this morning, too, after services are dismissed, to let her know that she's not alone. Let's pray together. Uh, Holy God, we come before you. Uh, Yvonne came up, Father. And, uh, Lord, we know that uh, a lot of these feelings of inadequacy and the things that... Uh, we don't think is right in our life uh, that that goes through our our minds father i ask your your help for you line as she's uh, struggling with these things lord you know her innermost being uh, as you know all of our innermost being father you know us better than we know ourselves lord uh, help us or just remember the how much that you loved us she sent your only begotten son to redeem all mankind and each of us personally and father we uh, pray that uh, this will be the focus of our thinking and give us strength in times of temptation and when uh, things are difficult for us to make the right decisions and have the right thoughts for you lord we lift yvonne up to you and we lift ourselves to you uh, in this prayer in jesus name amen
this afternoon we have a um, ministers, elders, and deacons meeting. It's moved, so note the, the time change from 4 o'clock. It's at 1.30 this afternoon. On September the 15th, the youth are going to go to the fair together, and they're just going to walk over there. That's September the 15th. September the 26th, remember to invite people. Go ahead and start inviting people. The goal is seven. Is that right, Lanny? Try to set, set a goal to invite seven people to Family Fun Sunday, which is September the 26th. Uh, there are two connect groups meeting today. The Sunday Drive group is going to the Salt Plains Wildlife Refuge, uh, and that's going to be from about 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, the building, well, I'm sorry, the Praise and Fellowship, PM Praise and Fellowship group will meet at the building at 5 o'clock, and they said, you know, you can be in both of them, so it's not the end of the world if you want to be in both. Is that right? Okay. Uh, Let's see, Thursday night lights. Let's, that is, I think that's this coming Thursday. I'm looking for the youth minister here. Uh, at the Agape Church of Christ at 6 to 7.30, there's going to be food and games. That's this coming Thursday. Is that right? Okay, thank you. Uh, also, the youth are going to be doing Frisbee golf September the 18th, and that's at 6 p.m., uh, the next Ladies Life Lessons will be September the Saturday, September the 25th, and I think that will feature Ruth Leather, Leatherman, and she'll be doing canning or something. Okay. Uh, once again, the Family Fun Sunday, that's 9 a.m. There will be coffee and donuts, 9.30 presentations and programs, uh, 10.30 worship, and then afterward will be the hot dogs and ice cream social. Uh, note that it, you're still able to join connect groups. Some of those have already started, and that's totally fine. You can join those at any time. So there's the Ladies Life Lessons, Men's Coffee, PM Praise and Encouragement, More Than Bread, and Saturday Drives. Saturday, not Saturday. Sunday Drives. Sorry. Third time. November the 7th. Uh, we will have the 100 plus one celebration. That's a celebration the church has been here for over 100 years. And then the next More Than Bread group will meet October the 2nd. That's all I've got. All right, please bow. Uh, dear God, thank you for uh, just allowing us to meet here this morning and uh, to do things that other people don't uh, get to do maybe safely or just out of ease. Uh, please help us to have a good rest of the day uh, for things just to kind of go as we uh, planned and help this to be a good start to our week. And so your son's name we pray, amen.